we'll now move on to our next speaker. So um, Antoine Montard is a junior principal at leading consulting firm uh, McKinsey & Co. Uh, Antoine has been with McKinsey & Company for over eight years, working across Europe and Australia, and he's worked across multiple industries specialising in strategy. His uh, latest uh, piece of work that he's working on is looking at how they can uh, fundamentally rethink the way McKinsey supports its clients in developing strategies. So I think a very exciting part of uh, an organisation there and what they're doing. So Antoine's team has also been uh, involved heavily in advising Bank West on some of the actual strategies that Ian mentioned. So please uh, welcome Antoine Montard. Thank you. So we'll spend the next 20 or 25 minutes talking about what does it mean to do strategy um, and also what it means to do strategy when uh, you have less resources than, than your competitors. Um, but to start with, just to set the scene, um, what you observe when you're competing against big fish is that they have a structural advantage over you. They have uh, more resources, more financial resources or talent. If you think about, for instance, uh, West, when West Farmers bought Coles, they've put billions of dollars in the business just to be able to compete against another big fish, Woolworths. Huge amount of resource. Today, uh, you look at the BHPs of this world that are fighting for talent. So even the big fish are actually fighting for those resources. So huge amount of resources. Um, diversification. Diversification allows them to have uh, the fingers in more pies, to be able to diversify their risk, to learn more about their customers, to be able to sell more of more products to the same customers. And that's a huge advantage that they, they leverage. And the last one is about buying and, and selling power, which is a, a lot more obvious. But so against all these, these three structural advantage, the question for you is uh, what can you do about it? So we'll spend the next 20 minutes going, at, going through four questions. And we think that when you do strategy, you need to go through all of these four questions uh, to really nail the strategy. The first one is um, understand why you create value. It seems a bit simple, but actually it's quite complex. And most, most of the strategy fail at this first stage, really understanding the root cause of why you create value. Why, where, and how. And we'll see some examples. Then, um, how is it likely to change? Like the, the business environment is not still. There's a lot of trends, uh, technologies changing, Customer behavior are, are, are changing quite heavily. Um, and so, you know, in front of this uh, future that will unfold and that will look quite different than, than today, uh, what, what can you learn from it and, and how can you create a perspective on it? Because it will fundamentally influence how you create value in the future. The next one is what can you do about it? And here we'll talk a lot about decisions and commitment. And that's what strategy is about. And last, how you implement your strategy. So four questions. First question is, uh, who do you think creates the most value among these four iconic companies? Starbucks, Tesco, Qantas, Rio Tinto? Any guess? Tesco. Wrong. <laughs> Tesco. <laughs> so when we talk about value, uh, or we, we can talk about creating uh, money, um, we'll look at what we call return on invested capital. Uh, and return on invested capital is a product of margin, sales margin, so EBIT margin pretty typically. Uh, so Starbucks is making 12% EBIT margin, Rio Tinto has a huge margin of 34%. But you shouldn't underestimate the capital required to generate these sales, what we call capital turnover. So for instance, for every dollar of investment, Tesco can generate $6 of revenues. But Rio Tinto needs a lot more capital because it's just very expensive to build a mine. And so you have these two examples, for instance, Starbucks and, and Rio Tinto, that have ver two very different models. And at the end, uh, Starbucks is a lot more profitable and creates a lot more value because it has a very scalable business model. They don't need too much capital uh, to generate their sales. So that's what we talk about when we say create value. It's create a uh, return on invested capital, which is over your cost of capital, which usually is about 10%. So value is, don't forget this, the capital turnover aspect of the business. So when Yan was talking about creating a lot of branches, that how much capital does it take to actually open all these branches? And then how much money each branch is making? So that's the value equation. 
but it's not that simple. Uh, let me drive you through a, a little case here. It's uh, Waterloo Station in London, uh, about 74 million passengers every day. And uh, if you're going to work and you're like me, you're craving for a coffee. So you walk through the station and, and you see a Starbucks there and you buy your, your coffee takeaway. It's about £2.50. It's quite expensive for a coffee. Probably costs about 75 pence to make. So £2.50. The question of the strategies is who's making money here? Who's winning in that market? Because in strategy, um, you you don't necessarily need to beat your competitors, but you need to beat the market around you. And so you need to think about your customers. Are you actually capturing as much value as you can from your customers? You need to think about the substitutes, other rivals, but also all the suppliers, the unions that are representing the employees, the, the coffee makers, uh, the landlord, the milk. So who's, who's capturing value here? It's actually the, the Waterloo Station. It's actually the landowner. And why is that? It's because in strategy, the value flows through the source of scarcity. And in that case, Waterloo had signed a contract with uh, Starbucks that there wouldn't be on any other coffee outlet in like 100 meters around them. So they've created this scarcity, and they've been able to monetize it because Starbucks was ready to pay quite a high price because the passenger were time poor and happy to pay £2.50. So actually, even though Starbucks is making a lot of money, in that market, the landowner is actually winning and is capturing most of the value of the £2.50. So the reality is less simple than you can think when you think about who's, who's winning in the market and, and who's creating money. Another example. Um, this is an example of a bank that uh, we've served a, a number of years ago. And when we go in an organization, um, we usually ask the question of, you know, what's your competitive advantage? What are you, why are you winning in the market? And uh, this bank had been growing quite fast, about 10% or so over the last 10 years. And usually we have quite different answers because the strategy is not clear in companies. But in that case, everybody said, well, we deliver exceptional customer service. And because of that, we've been growing for the past 10 years. And because of that, we'll keep continuing to grow over the next 10 years. But when you actually look at the resources of growth, so how come they, they grew faster than the market growth? It's because they had attractive locations. So the branches were in attractive suburbs that were growing fast with attractive demographics. And because they were positioned on mortgages. And so it's because someone somewhere in the bank is deciding about branch opening and is pretty smart about it. And someone 20 years ago entered this mortgage business. And actually, the overperformance with the share gain is minimal. So if you don't understand why you've been successful in the past, you can jeopardize how you're going to be successful in the future. The last example of, of uh, not oversimplifying is we find often useful to look at a market uh, at a granular level. And to do that, we, uh, we look at a heat map. And the example, that's US beverage and we look at channel and product segments. And here, what you can see is that there are some segments that are actually growing faster than others, even in not so attractive segments. You look at sparkling water. Overall, it's not an attractive segment. But in supercenter, it's actually growing quite fast, or in clubs. So if you oversimplify, and if you look at your market as an aggregate, it's quite easy to say, well, there are segments that are attractive and others that are not. But if you look at a very granular level, you can actually understand where the sources and the pools of value will be. So first question about understanding why you create value. So don't oversimplify. Really ask the question why and, and dig underneath and be curious about it. Um, and looking at a granular level is always quite a good idea to understand the, uh, the attractiveness. That was the first question. Second question is, how is it likely to change? That's a hard one. So in military strategy, you typically want to have the high ground because it's easier to defend. It's easier to defend against opponents. In strategy, it's easier to defend your pool of surplus against customers or suppliers. But 
getting this high ground is really, really difficult in business. If you think about Rio that I showed before, you need to build a mine. How expensive it is to, to build a mine. So trying to attain a high ground is not such a great idea. But there are two ways of creating your own high ground and your own pool of surplus. The first one is uh, through pure strategy, oh, sorry, through pure innovation. So you create a new market. Like you can think of Gore-Tex uh, or uh, the FedEx overnight delivery system. Pure innovation, that's really hard. The second one is uh, by riding the, the waves of trends. Because trends are a bit like, to continue the, uh, the comparison, a bit like earthquakes that can actually lower high grounds. You think about Kodak that was very successful and has been wiped away by digitization and can create new markets as well. And so what you need to do at this question is really understand uh, the implication of the trends in the market. And so what we'll do, uh, I'll give you snippets of five big trends that we see in the, in the markets today and then uh, I'll share some guideposts about how to do that. So five mega trends. Um, if you think about 20 years ago, uh, China was barely in the world economy. Uh, the world policy was made by the G7. Internet didn't exist. Today, China is the second world economy. The G7 became the G20. 1.5 billion of people are surfing the internet. 4 billion people have a mobile phone. So it's quite different. So try to project yourself like 20 years from now. It's impossible to imagine. But so we'll talk about these five mega trends and how we think they're going to shape what the future will look like. The great rebalancing. We've been talking for a while about emerging economies. But we think that we are really at a turning point. 50% of the GDP growth over the next 10 years will come from developing countries. In 2050, the uh, share of GDPs of the Western countries is likely to be less than it was in, in the 1700s. It's quite staggering. What is it driven by? It's driven by two virtuous cycle. The first one is uh, a, a lower dependency ratio. You start to have, in this developing economy, falling birth rate and a lot of workforce coming uh, in the working age. And so these two factors, with these two factors, you have uh, less mouth to feed and more workers. So quite a lot of momentum behind it. The second one is uh, urbanization. That's the biggest wave of urban urbanization we've ever seen, ever. 1.3 million people every single week are moving from the country to an urban center. And the effect it has is that these people who are used to work in farms are not, now have a job in cities, and the productivity and the output immediately increases. And so now, China and India have a productivity improvement of five-fold that of Western countries. So through this lower dependency ratio and this urbanization, the, uh, the developing economies are really the powerhouse of the world. And it will have tremendous impact on every single business everywhere. The flip side of that is that uh, it's a bad news for the developed market. The basic equation is growth is a factor of your labor force and the productivity you get. And the labor force, which is a, a, a factor behind the developing economy and, and productivity as well, it's not a good news story for the developed countries. We have more people going into retirement. The birth rate haven't increased. So labor was about 70% of, uh, of behind growth in the 70s. So in, uh, in the 70s in the US, for every dollar of growth, you had 70 cents of labor and 30 cents of productivity. Today, you must hear in the paper, everybody talking about productivity. Because it's an imperative. Because with this lower demographic dynamic, for one dollar of growth, we'll have 30 cents of labor. The rest needs to come from productivity if we want to maintain the growth that we've known like two or 3% a year. So the question for the businesses is how can they reinvent themselves to be more productive, but also there might be some business opportunities to help other companies become more productive. So productivity is, is an imperative. 
third trend, uh, we call that the, uh, the global grid. So the, the trade flows increased by 1.5 times uh, GDP growth over the last 20 years, and capital flows by three times the speed of GDP. So the, the, the world has become more interconnected, and we've seen with the crisis that also the bad news travel a lot faster. So consider this example of the iPhone. Who's really making the iPhone? Is it Apple, who has you know, 43 billion of revenue and 30,000 employees? Or Foxcom, who has almost a, a million of employees and 62 billion in revenues? It's not possible anymore to do business only in one geography and be dependent only on one geography. The world is really interconnected, and that creates opportunities to source new suppliers in other markets, but also there are some businesses that, ha that have been created to do this trade in between developed countries and developing countries. Next one, pricing of the planet. So whichever way you look at it, unless there's World War III, the demand for resources will increase by 30% in the next 10, 20 years. It's a good news story for Australia, obviously. But the issue is that uh, the supply is constrained. It's, it's becoming more difficult to, to get access to these resources. In our own ore, they need to start digging below the water table. A lot of complexity behind it. Or you need to go deeper to, to find the oil. They're trying to transform the, uh, the coal seam gas into LNG. Very complex technical problems. So you have high demand. Supply is becoming complex and very costly in Australia. And you have more regulation because the public and the government wants to have more sustainable uh, resource development. So it's another big trend that there's no answer. The other, the other question is when this growth will fade out, how will these countries survive? That's the resource curse. So this will shape uh, what business looks like in 20 or 30 years. And the last one, the, the market state. You've noticed that uh, government and, and the state has become more prominent over the last, I would say, five to 10 years. Even before the GFC, uh, government had a role of trying to mitigate the impact of globalization on individuals. And then with the GFC, they took an active role in, uh, with fiscal package and, and regulation. And the state, we think, is here to stay. There's a lot of issues about the level of debt, but the state is there and it will create business opportunities, but also will have tremendous impact in terms of regulation on some existing business. So think about like in banking, all the, the wealth regulation that will have a lot of impact on all the IFAs. So these five trends, and you know, th there are many others that can be more or less relevant for your business, but we would encourage you to scan what are the trends that might have an impact, direct or indirect, on your business. But you don't have an answer once you know about these trends. So what do you do with them? So the analogy here is like uh, a bit skiing in the fog. And if you can see 10% better than your competitor, you can have an edge. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to see everything. But you just need to see a bit better. And here, I'll give you some guideposts. Like when you're skiing and in the fog and you see some guideposts along the way, that helps you tremendously. So some guideposts uh, for you. First, we see that a lot of businesses are looking too much on the short term. You're looking at extrapolation in the next five years, looking back for two or three years. So consider that example in, in the beer industry. Three segments, premium, mainstream, and light beers. If you look at two years, it's quite stable in between the different segments. But if you look at a 10-year trend, you can see that the premium beers are increasing really fast. And what, what, what's the implication for Foster's Allah in Nathan? The implication is that these premium beers, uh, as they're quite expensive, they allow small brewers and macro brewers to emerge. And they threaten the oligopoly. They're chipping away the oligopoly and they weaken them. And what they have done historically is they've been buying all those small brewers. But that's quite expensive and not necessarily sustainable. But so if you look at the longer term, uh, you can actually see trends emerge a lot more. Second lesson, don't be myopic. It's quite important to, uh, to do a lot of work to understand trends. You, you can't know everything. 
but usually the first, or the first impact of the change is quite self-evident. But the money and the opportunity is when you look at the second or third order effect. So example of the TV in the 50s. So when the TVs appeared, it was quite obvious that uh, it would have an impact on movie theaters. People will watch TV at home and go less to the movie theaters. It would be more difficult to lure the uh, audience to the next Western. And the Hollywood studios were used to produce B-grade movies. They were not really great quality. So uh, in the 60s, these studios were struggling. They didn't really adapt their model. So what happened? What happened is that you had independent producers that emerged. Big studios were serving as financiers and distributors, and you had these independent producers that assembled a hand-picked team to produce a good quality movie because they could take that risk. And that's how they got people back to the movie theaters. But so a second order effect of TVs is actually the emergence of independent movie producers. That was the business opportunity. Last, uh, just a word of good news. You, you actually don't need to know everything. This is a story in the, la in the late 90s. Um, it was a, a record label in Europe. And I don't know if you remember in the late 90s, but what happened is you, you could burn CDs and copy, basically, uh, music using your computer. And when the CEO of that company uh, saw that, he understood that the fundamental protection of his industry, copyright, was threatened. Because if anyone could copy a CD, how can you protect yourself? He had no idea about Napster's iPod, iTunes, MP3. But at that time, it was, none of that existed. But he understood that the very reason why he was making money was actually threatened. And he actually decided to sell the business before anyone else. He saved about $3 billion for the shareholders doing so. But he didn't know, need to know everything. He just needed to understand the impact he had on why he was creating value. So out of these trends, um, once you understand why you create value, you need to, to see what can happen in the world and, and form your own view of how the future can unfold and understand a bit some of these second order implications and take actions on them. That was the second question. So once you've done all that work, the question in strategy is what can you do about it? And here we talk about strategic decision. And where I think uh, most companies get it wrong is that the, the word strategy is overused. Uh, a commentator says that strategy is more a reflection of the pay grade rather than the quality of the thinking. So what, what, what is really strategy? So we talk about commitment. A strategic decisions need to be a big commitment. It needs to be made ahead of time and difficult to reverse. If it's easy to reverse, it's not strategic. So let me give you an example on, on Starbucks. If you lay out the different decisions along the frequency, so if you look at promotions, you can have weekly promotions and advertising, you have monthly advertising and value of per product offer. So if you, if you lay that out that spectrum, the more you're on the right, the less strategic you are. Because the, a promotion on a chalkboard, a, a chocolate chip cookie with a coffee, you can change that almost daily or weekly. So it's not strategic if you can change it. But if you look at, for instance, a service model, if you're a self-service uh, coffee shop or you actually have some person to, to serve you, it's a completely different labor model, completely different training. You actually, it's actually very difficult to reverse. So the more you go on the, right, on the left, the more strategic it is. And when you go to brand proposition, which is every 20 years, it might be a bit more vision than strategy. But what you need to do is to figure out what are those handful of strategic decisions that are at stake. Because often we, we find people dealing with many, many decisions on the right that could be reversed and are tactical. And strategy is about taking these few big decisions. So the word you use is commitment. Then once you have these few big decisions, uh, the, the question is, uh, how, how can you make this decision in a coherent way? And I think Jan talked about it in terms of uh, the network, the uh, location of the, the branches, the target demographics, the value proposition. So let me give you an example of uh, NVIDIA, which is a, a chip manufacturer. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's, they're doing 3D chips. In the early 90s, um, they wanted to become the sound blaster of multimedia chips. Um, and they released a product that was a failure, the NV1, 
uh, that did not work at all. And so they sat down and they looked at what strategy they can implement to win in that market. And they, they decided two things. They decided to focus on 3D graphics, so very targeted market, not try to, to have all the, all the cheap market, but 3D graphics. And the second one is they decided to be best in class. It seems a bit fluffy, but you'll see that it's not that fluffy. The implication of that is, um, as they wanted to be best in class, they looked at the market, and chips are released every 18 months in the chip market, every 18 months. And they said, how can we be best in class? They decided that actually releasing a chip every six months would make them best in class most of the time, because most of, more often than not, they would be ahead of the competition. But the question was, how can you, in a market where it takes 18 months to develop a chip, how can you release a chip every six months? What they did is they had three different teams of engineers working in parallel on three different chips that would be released six months apart. And that allowed them to release a chip every six months. At the same time, to do that, they couldn't afford any delay. So they invested heavily in technology, in simulation software, to be able to predict the issues with production, to be able to do all the software programming while they were doing the hardware at the same time. And they were very successful. They deterred uh, Intel to enter the market. Um, and that was basically their recipe to, to compete against these big fishes. So, need to make some real choices to decide what you do and what you don't do. And you also need to have a coherent business model behind to deliver it. But at the beginning, you actually need to be, to be making really big decisions about what to do and what not to do. When you're smaller, you can do less. So that was the third question about making strategic decisions and commitment. The, the last one is um, how do you implement? You know, when, uh, when I go in a company, I try to understand the strategy, you can do two things. You can look at a pack, and usually you have a couple of slides, and you try to understand what the pack is saying, or you can ask three questions. Where do you spend your time? Where is your best people? How do you spend your money? Because at the end of the day, if you don't shift one of these three resources, you don't implement the strategy. What we find is that often that's a correlation of capital for a 15-year period in a given company. What we find is often nothing changed. So either in that company the strategy stayed the same for 15 years or they never implemented a strategy. The allocation of resources need to shift. And so the, the question here for you is when, when you've made all these decisions is what change will you make on talent? What change will you make on the way you spend your time and you spend your money? And basically the message is you need to be unfair. You, you shouldn't follow the organization structure or what was allocated last year. You need to be fundamentally unfair. And that's the role that you have when you implement a strategy. So that concludes a bit our, our journey of strategy of four questions. Really get into why you create value and be curious about it. Try to understand how the world could change and how that could impact why you create value or not. Make, make big decisions and commitments. And at the end, shift the resources, shift your time, your talent, and your capital to make it happen. Thank you.